Hello, everybody. This is Mark Kemp at CampgroundViews.com, and I've got a special little webinar session here for you. We're going to talk about one of the, what amazingly, one of the most important things that you're probably considering in running your RV park, and that's that four-letter word, Wi-Fi. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Wi-Fi and what to consider when you're looking at um, either installing or upgrading, and I guess even maintaining your Wi-Fi network to ensure that it's very important. So KOA, <clears throat> if you excuse me, <laughs> KOA a few years ago did a survey and they found that the number one and number two amenities people wanted were Wi-Fi, depending on the year, whether it was one or two, but it's a very important amenity. Your guests all show up with connected devices now. Heck, their TVs are connecting online even. So your guests are, are really starting to demand this Wi-Fi and as you probably are aware, it's a bit of an issue. You know, being able to provide that bandwidth at a level of service that's necessary, it's starting to become an issue that, um, you know, it's always been an issue for like 10 years, but it's really becoming an issue where guests are starting to pick and choose parks based upon the internet speed. So I have Chris Fellows here. He's an expert on Wi-Fi, and I'll allow Chris to go ahead and introduce himself to you and kind of give us some background on how he got to where we're at today. So Chris, uh, first off, thank you for agreeing to come on here, and feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself and let everybody know that you know what you're talking about. Well, hi. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, my name is Chris Fellows, and I've recently uh, started uh, uh, installing hospitality networks uh, specifically for RV parks uh, around the country. Uh, I'm currently on a job, uh, and I'll be uh, working on, on this particular job. I've been on it for a couple of months now, and I'll, I'll be uh, moving on to my next here soon. Uh, I've got... Uh, years of experience in this. I, I did 20 years in the Air Force in telecommunications, uh, all in the wireless realm. Then I worked for the state of Michigan for 15 years uh, on very large scale networks. We had uh, 1,100 uh, sites spread across uh, the entire state of Michigan, uh, about 70,000 uh, employees and 125,000 ports in our data center. Uh, so I've got quite a bit of experience in this area, and uh, with the advent of uh, some of the new systems that are coming out here and the reduction in cost, it's now within the reach of most uh, owner-operators to put in cutting-edge systems into their parks. And there's a, there's a great interest in that, and I'm hoping that I'm providing a, uh, a service that... Uh, that people uh, are interested in. So far, it's worked out really well. You know, that's a, that's a really good point. You know, what's funny is as I'm recording this, we're currently at an RV park right now up in South Lake Tahoe. They'll remain nameless, but the reason I bring it up is this is the first time in nine years of full-time RVing that I'm actually doing work on the park's Wi-Fi system. Up until this point, we've always brought our own Wi-Fi. We, we pay a lot of money for high-speed Verizon, you know, 4G cards and all that stuff. And this is the first time I've ever tied into a park's Wi-Fi and been able to use it. So um, let's go into that a little bit. You, you mentioned that all of a sudden these high-end systems are coming down in price and, and availability. So if I'm operating in a park, what does that mean? What should, where should they start? I mean, let's assume that they, they have just a basic Wi-Fi with a, maybe a router and, and, you know, I don't even know what else. But wh wh what should they start thinking and, and looking at? So the first, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. And the, the, uh, the, the system that I'm on right now is a system I'm building. So I'm actually on the parks okay. Wi-Fi as well. Uh, the very first thing that, a, that an owner operator should consider is their clients, right? They need to, they need to consider uh, who they're gonna be servicing and what they want to provide. The very first question I always ask is, you know, what are you looking to provide your customers? Uh, you know, do you want them to be able to just get their email and maybe post on Facebook? Do you want them to be able to stream uh, Netflix and YouTube? Or do you want them to play video games, right? That's really kind of the three levels of, of network that, that I would recommend building. And that all has to do with, uh, uh, you know, how big their park is and how much coverage and what their budget is, obviously. Uh, in recent years, very sophisticated uh, systems have have proliferated uh, in the marketplace. There are several manufacturers out there now that offer uh, systems with high-end capabilities that are within the reach 
of somebody uh, to, you know, a, a small operation, somebody that's got 20, 25 sites and, you know, wants their customers to be able to, uh, to do the things that they want to do on the internet. Now, as you mentioned, uh, that those services offered on the internet have increased exponentially over the last five or 10 years. And I personally believe that uh, if, you, if you're building a new park today and you're considering putting in, for example, a uh, cable system to provide cable television to your, uh, your customers, I think that's the wrong move. It's going to be yeah, actually, I'd, I'd agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, that's a good point because they, I mean, because people don't even watch cable TV anymore. They're using, no. they're streaming. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But the 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 benefits of streaming, you know, it's on demand. You get to watch whatever you want, whenever you want. You can stop it. You can move from room to room. There's, the benefits are just crazy. So, uh, and that's what everybody's doing. And and what I through my experience over the last couple of years, I found that a good rule of thumb is four to five devices per household or per RV. And uh, so we tend to size things based on the number of uh, sites times four or five, and then depending on how what the owner operator wants to do as far as uh, level of service goes. And like I said, there's lots of choices okay. out there. Well, let's talk about that. So you're saying four or five, <clears throat> assume four or five devices per site. So what would that? So now, and obviously, I'm I'm actually I'm a dummy on this, so I I don't know anything about Wi-Fi, so I might be the best person to kind of run this interview because you know a lot of the park owners would be like, Mark's a moron, he doesn't even know what he's asking. So it may really help get some good questions and answers here. So four or five site devices per site, what does that mean then? What 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 should they consider on that? Yeah, so that means that in every every recreational vehicle, every RV, every coach that pulls into your your uh, park is probably bringing between four, five, six, maybe even. In my personal case, it's twelve uh, <laughs> separate devices that into your park. And and if they have, you know, it's, it's going to be mom and dad's cell phone. There's probably going to be a smart TV in the rig. There's probably going to be a uh, laptop computer or a tablet, uh, a gaming system. Uh, some of the uh, the Blu-ray devices are also network connected and nowadays you've got things like uh, uh, smart home devices Alexa personal assistance those sort of things are are being uh, my Alexa's listening to me right now <laughs> so those type of devices she's are taking gonna, your order <laughs> yeah she did uh, those type of devices are going to come into your park and, and the people are going to expect connectivity for them so you you need to to plan for that. So okay, so what how how would they go about planning for that then? I mean, what what is the process now? Okay, I, I assume I'm building for five devices per site. I have let's do forty sites. You know, so that would be you know two hundred devices. <clears throat> what does that mean? Like what? How does that work then? Okay, so let me approach this from the biggest mistake I see people making. So the, big, the biggest mistake I've seen so far is that people want to throw money at their ISP for more bandwidth. And that almost never solves the problem. The, the, the problem typically is not bandwidth. And let me just give you an example. So there, there's a formula to answer your question directly. Uh, okay. There's a, there, there's a formula, for, formula for sizing networks. And it's, it's, it's segregated into different areas of industry. So for hospitality, the formula is 20 to one. So if you want to give your customers, uh, you, so the basic level that most people go today is they, they wanna make sure that they can stream YouTube, they can get their email, they can post to Facebook, right? And Netflix, those are the, those are the four biggies. Uh, in order to do that, if you can give each client three megabits download and one megabit upload, they'll be happy. But that three megabits download, and one megabit upload has to be consistent, right? It has to be there all the time and at that level. So <clears throat> just throwing money at the ISP, you know, to give, you know, you got a hundred megabit or 250 megabit or half a gigabit, 
uh, that you're paying for from the ISP is not going to do that. It's not not going to. You may get it right at your at your router, uh, you know, your point of presence where the ISP is is providing the internet to the park. But now you've got to distribute it to the to the rest of the park, and it has to be done evenly, and it has to be done reliably. So uh, I, I ask a series of questions when I'm talking to uh, prospective uh, partners here, and uh, through those series of questions, I'll make a recommendation on uh, what level of internet uh, they need to get from their provider, and it's typically much lower than they think. So really? a good example. Okay, so yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So you said the 20 to 1. I think you're going to go into that example now. So, so you're saying the 3 megabits down, 1 up. Are, are you multiplying that by 20 then? Is that is that how it works or are you going to give well, me that example? So, no. So, so what you need to do is figure out what your maximum load could be, right? So if you say you had, let's keep the numbers simple. Let's say that there's uh, two devices. We're figuring on two devices per customer. And so this would be more like for a hotel. Two devices for okay. for per room and we have 10 rooms, right? And I wanna provide them five megabits download, two megabits upload. You can kind of throw away upload, download's the only thing anybody cares about. So in that scenario, it would be two times 10, 20 times five or a hundred, right? That's a hundred megabits. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to provide those people all that at once, but for hospitality, you only need one twentieth of that. So, in because it's it's called oversubscription. Telephone companies have been doing it for a hundred years. So you figure out what your maximum bandwidth is, and then you divide it by a number that has been figured out by the industry already on how many people are going to be using that service simultaneously. Right, and for hospitality in a, in a park, it's twenty to one. So you run it through a you know calculation to come up with a number. Like I said, it's always lower than what most people think. So you can save, and, and that's a that's so, a reoccurring cost. And so you're saying, uh, so in that example, the 100 megabits is, is necessary, you know, or, or the the maximum load. You're dividing that by 20, so you're coming down to five. So you're saying that right. they only need five megabits from five their megabits. ISP in order in order to provide the service. That's a, absolutely correct. wow. Yeah. Wow. If, okay. it's, if it's distributed that's a, that's, properly. That's a, sig never, that's a significant statement. I think people are going to yeah. start arguing just on that one alone. Yeah. So so, yeah. so I'm the owner. You just told me that. What is my response to you? Like, yeah, right. And then what is your response back to them? I have data. So okay. <laughs> it's, so right now I've got two. Is I've got one really good uh, data set, and I'll soon have two. Uh, so in the last park I worked on, they didn't believe me. They went out and signed a contract for 100 megabit of, uh, and that you know there was no uh, uh, cable or or ISP that could bring that in uh, uh, over traditional lines. So I contracted with a, a wireless internet service provider to bring a microwave link into the park, and and they paid for 100 megabit uh, on a five-year contract. Uh, I tried to talk them out of that. You know, the, my formula said it would be much lower than that. So now they've been running for a year and a half, and I've got data. They've never topped 15 megabytes ever, and they and wow. they have typically they have typically 60 people connected at once, 60 devices, and they've never topped 15 meg. So. Wow, that's significant. So, and I, I would imagine when they're hitting that 15 meg, that's when everybody in the evening, when everybody, you know, because in my mind, when you're saying that I'm thinking the evening, when everybody's home, they're watching, they're streaming, that would be like peak load. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'd easily hit 100 megabits. I mean, if my park's full, of, you know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, the parks that have a lot of long-term tenants, maybe they're oil field workers, whatever, they show up from the job site, they're all streaming. You're saying, you know, we got the data. It's only 15, even though you're thinking it's 100. Uh, that's incredible. Right, because IP networking is bursty. So it's not even that you, you hear these terms like streaming, but if you yeah. even if you watch your own computer, it's not a constant stream. It grabs some bandwidth when it needs it, buffers in a bunch of data into your device, whatever you're using to, to get the data in, and then presents it to you at a rate you can assimilate it, 
right? Yes. So the 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 network itself is just grabbing the the uh, uh, data or the the bandwidth when it needs it. So yeah, you can have a bunch of people streaming media, a bunch of people surfing the web all at the same time. And if it's distributed properly, and if okay. the controls are in place properly, because what the problem everybody runs into is they put this out there and <clears throat> some, and they don't put controls on it. And then somebody comes that was in. Gonna, and, I, and I think that's where we're going now. So basically what you're saying is most parks, because I've always thought that the argument is, is that the parks are in rural areas. They don't have access to an ISP and that's why the internet sucks. And it sounds like that's really not the case. It's the, it's, you know, you've got this fire hose of data coming in and now you're distributing it out and it wasn't being distributed out properly. So the, right. the next question would be, how do, how do I as a park operator, somebody building out or upgrading, what's the next steps? How do I do this now? So planning is critical, right? I mean, you really have to sit down and, and do the math and, 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 and do the surveys that are necessary to properly lay out and plan the distribution of the signal that you're going to be providing. Uh, and don't get me wrong, there are still cases out there. I've run into a couple of them in the last couple of months where there is really no good option for some of these rural parks uh, for reliable internet. That's changing and then uh, in the next uh, few years, uh, there are some operators out there now who are putting up some new systems that will be worldwide available, uh, some low earth orbit satellite systems uh, hmm. that will be available to everybody on the planet. I'm expecting that in the next five, five, six years. <clears throat> uh, and then that problem will go away. But right now there are still locations in the country where really your only option is traditional satellite uh, connectivity, and that's still not up to snuff. The problem with that is twofold. Uh, it's, there's a latency problem, and latency is the delay between the time that a user asks for something and the time that the other end hears it and responds. So with traditional satellite, because there's a physics problem in there, the satellite's 40,000 miles from the planet, and it's gotta make that trip twice for every bit. So light speed is fast, but it's not infinitely fast and you got to wait for that. So that's problem number one. And because the satellites were put up over the last 10 or 15 years, technology wasn't up to the standards that it is today and you couldn't have as much channel width on those satellites. So the operators in order to, to deal with that, they limit you per month on how much data you can trans transmit. So even at that, park where I'm only I'm never hitting 15 uh, megabytes at a time we are transmitting over a terabyte every month which is a huge amount of data so wow it, so the, it's doing that 15 megabytes constantly right you could never do that on satellite so there are some park operators out there today that are going to have a hard time uh, okay. finding find a service provider so then, okay, so let's assume, so that would be, and, and I think that is a smaller and smaller group because there's been efforts, and I, you can correct me on this, there's been efforts to bring internet to rural areas, and I know that there's been a lot of rural parks recently that have gotten, you know, some really good, I mean, faster than if you go into a city, you get some really good internet. Have you seen that as an overall trend? It sounds like that's a yes. Yes, absolutely. The, the, we are getting better with, you know, I, we're almost third world in a lot of ways, here in the U.S. Uh, compared to the rest of the world, but we're starting to catch up. Okay, so now once they get past the ISP problem and, and that data thing, that 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 really becomes a because I again I've always heard and I've always thought that you need this massive <clears throat> bandwidth coming in your park in order to provide that. And so you, you've uh, that's a really interesting data point. So now once they get that data coming in, and now I'm going to be really dumb. So I guess it goes into like a modem, right? And then it goes to a router and that router sends it out to your park. What should they be looking for at that? Is, is that where they start considering and mapping it out? Or, or how does, what is the technology now? What are you recommending? And, and what should they be shopping for when they're building out the rest of their park to tie into that ISP? So the, your basic network, design consists of an ISP drop coming in 
uh, via a modem or a router, it's one of the two. Uh, and that's where their network ends and yours begins, okay? So the very first thing you need to put up is some sort of protection from the internet, right? Especially that now that you're gonna have people other than yourself on the network. Uh, you're opening yourself to liability otherwise. So you have to have a firewall, right? And that can be built into a single device with a router or it can be a separate device. Uh, the, the networks that I'm currently deploying, are that's an integrated device. It's a firewall, router, uh, and a small switch included. Uh, you also typically, for the modern networks, you need what's called a controller. So the controller is basically a small, or in some cases not so small, computing device that you load a piece of software on that manages all the rest of the system. Then you're gonna need a, a switch uh, to distribute that signal coming in to the various uh, devices, APs. And there's so many things you can put on your, on your IP network nowadays. I mean, it, it really is getting to be a, uh, uh, you know, a buffet of, of devices that you can check. So in this current deployment, I'm putting up uh, access points, I'm putting up layer two, point-to-point uh, -point radio systems, and I'm putting up security camera systems all on the same backbone that the uh, hmm. uh, Wi-Fi. What's network. a layer two? It, can you define that for me? What does that mean? So I don't, I, you have to forgive me. I tend to fall into techno babble uh, <laughs> just years of it. So the, the IP, the internet protocol networks are based on a, on a what's a, called the seven layer system. And layer one is wire. Layer two is the network layer. So that's basically how you connect point to point. And then okay. layer three is is the what you and I use to surf the internet. So layer three is as high as I ever go. So I okay. I, I build from layer one up uh, to, and you really have to do it that way to ensure everything's working right. Otherwise, there's there's some pretty complicated problems that can come into IP networks if you don't uh, plan out from layer one to layer three. So okay, so that that the wire. So when when you're then you're I guess you're you're sending this data out or the signal out to access points. Is that the correct term for it? Yes. So uh, the the signal coming in the 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 doorway coming in from your uh, your service provider needs to be distributed. So you can do that in a couple of ways, right? You can, if, you, if you're building brand new and you know exactly what you're going to do, you can wire the whole park. Wiring is, is always preferable. Uh, and that's physical wiring, right? That's a physical wire, yeah. The, okay. the problem with wiring is sometimes it's not practical at all, especially if you're you know, in a city and need to get a signal from building to building. Uh, or if you're uh, building a, a new network in an old park right it's you don't want to be trenching or stringing wires airily so that used to be a big problem with today's technology it's not uh hmm. there's the, the, there's what are called these layer two radios or point-to-point -point radios that can act as a virtual wire okay and it connects and this is where most people when they're designing and building their networks fail they don't they don't they they put up an access point at the point that their uh, service provider is dropping off the internet, and then they have a access point or two that will connect back to that, either wired or wirelessly. But if they go out beyond that, which most parks are much larger than the range that you can reliably do that, then you, you add in what's called hops into the communication. And every hop adds in latency, which we talked about earlier. Latency is terrible in networking uh, because it adds up. It, it, and not only does it add up, but if one system is waiting for the next hop to do something, then it's the the it's not a coordinated wait. So it just every hop you add into the communication string is going to affect your end user for sure. Okay. So okay. the. This, these new layer two radios that connect point to point can can fix that for you 
by sending a signal from your ISP point of presence all the way, well, they can, the, I did a measurement from here and we're only up about 30 feet on our main tower and I can reach out four miles in every direction. Wow. Yeah, so uh, you put up another radio there, you grab the signal and now I can redistribute just like I'm sitting at the point of presence where my ISP was. So okay, so brand, so instead brand, of using, so instead of using like routers in between, or I, I, I'm like access points are like communicating to each other, and that's your hops. This is more of like a direct, you know, like a dish. I, I guess is, is, is it look like a dish it's sending a it, signal, it, and it, it, it just has to be pointed at it, right? Okay. That's that's correct. And it, the best way to think about it is it's an, it's an invisible wire. So okay. it's a it, it's an invisible wire that can reach these radios can reach 15, 20 kilometers. So do trees impact them? They do, but there's ways around that. So that's an, uh, another another reason to talk to somebody like me before you buy, at least, uh, because if there are trees in the way, you, you don't you wouldn't. So your first go to, if you've got direct line of sight, and it's beautiful, and there's nothing going to be in the way, and you're high enough up off of reflective surfaces like the ground, then you're going to want to go with a five gigahertz point-to-point uh, -point radio. That's the highest bandwidth. That's that's the same frequency range that microwave works in. Okay, but if you've got a, and it's not a very uh, uh, crowded network. They also make 2.4 gigahertz point-to-point uh, -point radios. I really don't recommend those to anyone because almost every wireless device that's out there runs on 2.4 gigahertz, which means there's a huge amount of interference in the 2.4 gigahertz range. It's cheaper, but it's there's so much interference that you're not gonna be happy with the results. Then there's a 900 megahertz free band as well. The 900, the advantage of 900 megahertz, it's more expensive, but it can punch through buildings, it can punch through stands of trees, it can uh, reflect off of water surfaces. It, 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 it won't go as far and you can't put as much bandwidth through it. It's limited to about a, about 200 megabits on a, on a 900 megahertz, but it saves uh, uh, so many networks because it can go through those type of obstructions. So that, that's an important okay, so design right. situation. So now you've got that signal out there and then is that signal, that radar dish, is it directly connected to, and I guess access point is the right term, so it's directly connected to that access point. So then the users, when they log on to Wi-Fi, they're just hitting that little box. It's communicating directly back to the ISP that are online. Um, what then at that point, the users, you know, how do you protect, I mean, it sounds like your firewall protects your network. What should right. you be monitoring as a business then? What should you be watching for and that type of stuff? That's a really good question. So first of all, you're going to want to control your end user, right? You don't want one person to fire up their laptop and turn on BitTorrent and A, do something illegal and B, eat all of your bandwidth, right? And they will do that. There's no two ways about it. So you- Yeah, that's yeah, me, by the way. Yeah, I, I eat up yeah. your bandwidth. Well, you, if, you, if you, you try to eat up my bandwidth, but I wouldn't let you. <laughs> and I would let you use three megabytes or five megabytes, whatever, whatever we've decided, depending on our connection to the internet. So that needs to be controlled. It needs to be controlled tightly uh, by the owner operator, right? And those things can be, I'm making it sound complicated. It's really not. It's just a decision that needs to be made early on. So as an example, the park I'm building now, I have two networks. I'm limiting even the corporate people to 20 megabits uh, while they're connected to that mm. network uh, so that they don't take bandwidth away from their guests. And I'm limiting the guests to five megabits down and two megabits up during their stay. That's more than enough to stream uh, broadband or high, high resolution video. So nobody will be complaining about that. This, this park actually has, was very lucky uh, there was a uh, <clears throat> a uh, consortium of the of a couple of small cities around, and you, this is the type of thing the owner operators need to check into too. They need to okay. they need to talk to their their civic leaders. They need to find out uh, what's been done with the federal broadband money that has been out there for the last decade. Uh, a lot of cities have taken 
taking advantage of that. The, these little towns out here in the middle of Utah did, and they built an entire fiber consortium network through uh, a, a tri-city area. So they've got uh, this fiber that is now laid through the ground that several ISPs have piggybacked on, and now they're trying to uh, sell it. So uh, we got a really, really good deal. Uh, I, through communication with the, uh, the consortium, I got the construction uh, cost waived because they were willing to sign a longer contract. That's always a, a, a good bargaining chip on the customer's part. When you're talking to your ISP, you can offer them a longer term contract for lesser fees. So that's something mm -hmm. to keep, keep in mind when you're talking to your I, to your prospective ISP. Remember, you're hiring them. Uh, I, I know it's hard, but in this country, it's really hard. Yeah, it seems weird. Yeah, it yeah. seems weird. So the, we're, all, usually, we're all used to the cable companies, right? They they right, own us, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, because they've got a they they really do have a monopoly. You know, you really in most a lot of places a residential user only has one choice. Uh, so then you have no choice, right? So, uh, but you're not. That's another thing to remember: as an owner operator, you're not a residential use, user. You're a business. Yeah. So you're gonna you're, you're gonna pay more than what you're used to, right? So get ready for a little sticker shock when you when you approach the ISP. But I recommend, I, and I will recommend this to everybody: don't buy a residential package for your park. Residential packages are not guaranteed. They are uh, that what's called best effort, right? They'll sell it as a 100 megabyte or a 60 megabyte connection. But, it, you know, during high usage, if you're only getting 10 or 15, eh, we tried. That's what you're going to get. Whereas with a business account, you get what's called an SLA, right? A service level agreement, right? Where they promise to do A, B, and C. You promise to pay your bill, which is going to be higher than you're used to for a longer period of time, right? So this park signed a 10-year contract for X amount of dollars to get 100 megabit service over fiber. That 100 megabit is gonna be more than they need for a while, but the system that they're putting in is, is a, a, like I said, a pretty high-end system. And if they wanted to, they could later buy more bandwidth over that fiber and sell to the neighborhood. Uh, sell internet to the neighborhood. Wow, uh, yeah. really? Okay, so that, that really goes big term. So, so immediately what I'm hearing you, and you mentioned the higher cost for the commercial, um, the commercial access. The other, the other, I guess that goes to the cost question. So if I'm, let's, let's do it in a few different ways. So let's, let's talk about the, the park who has existing Wi-Fi. It's old school, it needs to be upgraded. What should they be thinking about general budget? And obviously, you know, not exact, but general budget. Yeah. Um, let's go to option two is, a, is an operator who's going to be installing it themselves. They're not very big, general budget. And then let's talk about like the, you know, a park like what you're working on, a higher end park who's looking to spend some money and have serious um, bandwidth. What are the general budget ranges for those type of installations? So uh, that is going to vary widely, depending on a lot okay. of factors. Uh, first of all, is you know the, the biggest the biggest cost you're going to get is paying a contractor if you if you if you're bringing somebody in to do it. You can basically take every bit of infrastructure that you need to build and equipment that you need to buy and triple it. Okay, that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, let's just talk about equipment for a minute because that that's kind of the the factor yeah, some people are going to try to do it themselves or whatever so let's yeah. talk about equipment so you first of all you need to consider your reoccurring costs which is going to be your isp uh you may uh, typically that's the only reoccurring cost when i do an install i always uh put in a monitoring monitoring system as well uh there is a uh, small annual cost associated with that uh, it's a subscription-based service so no matter where I'm at in the country, I can keep an eye on your network. Uh, but typically speaking, those are your only reoccurring costs. Uh, your one-time costs are gonna include uh, your, your networking equipment. Now, if you're talking about a middle, so a high feature, I, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody putting in a low feature network anymore you're, because stuff has come down so much, you wanna go for a high feature. Uh, hmm. capability 
at a company that offers a system that has high features associated with, you don't have to put them all in, but you wanna go with a company that has at least those features available. So, <clears throat> uh, you, I, the typical park, let's say 25 sites, a small park, uh, 25 sites spread over, you know, three or four acres, you know, maybe a thousand foot on a side uh, for the networking equivalent dollars. But you have to remember that's just for the, the, the networking hardware. You still have to put in things like uh, masts for your antennas. You have to uh, trench in power to the mass locations. You've got to uh, probably put some some sort of uh, uh, connecting points or or, or even more mass at, at the buildings where the internet's coming in. Uh, there, you have to buy wire, right? So even the wireless network has to be wired at some point. So there's a lot of little costs that don't get associated with it in people's minds and they tend to overlook that when they're when they're planning there's a lot of little yeah, good point. yeah there's a lot of little things that you don't consider so for example you can go out and and buy pre-made cables right so i need i need 32 feet of cable to go from my ap down to my power source well, if I go to buy a commercially made cable, I can only get a 25 foot cable or a 50 foot cable. They're not gonna have a 32 foot cable. So you can either do that and end up with a spaghetti mess of wire someplace because you had to buy a cable that was way too long, or you can custom make a cable. If you're gonna, the, the custom made cable is gonna be a lot cheaper. You can buy better cable, but now you have to buy, A, you have to know how to make the cable. And B, you have to buy the tools in order to make that cable. So those type of things need to be taken into consideration if you're planning on doing it yourself. And also, there's quite a bit of work involved in things like mast uh, erections and, and that sort of thing. I mean, you're digging holes, you're, you're mixing concrete, that sort of thing. So, so I mean, so what, what are you talking, five to ten grand would be a uh, yeah, ballpark then if you're going to do so it from scratch with the, the high stuff? Yeah, the smallest network I built, uh, uh, which was in Texas, uh, was a 12 AP, no security camera. It was spread over about seven acres, so it was pretty widespread. Uh, I had to put in several uh, layer two links in it. Cost about uh, $3,200 in total for equipment and, and okay. expenses reason hardware and is that one, is that cost something that you know if they're going to do it you're buying all that equipment at once or is it something that you can buy as you install it and you know what is that installation process like for them so you know can they they take that 3200 spread it out over three months as they're installing it or is it something that go buy it all now so you have it and then you install it over the course of a few weeks so if they're doing it themselves they absolutely could to, could spread it out i mean i don't think you could talk a uh an integrator, an installer company, and to, and I mean, you could probably get somebody to uh, set you up with a oh, pay over time uh, scenario to get that done. That's not the way I do business. Uh, the way I, the way I I do it is I have them. We sit down, <clears throat> we figure out what they want to do. I do the design. Uh, I send it to them. I explain it to them in a session such as we're having here. Uh, answer any questions they have, then they make a decision on whether they're going to do it. If they're going to buy it, they buy the equipment and ship it to me. And then I configure it all up, get it all tested and working, and then I drive to their park, uh, wherever they happen to be. I take up a spot for a month and I install it, test it, train, document, the whole nine yards, uh, get, get that all done. That's when, when they're happy, they pay me my fee and I drive away. So that's my business model. Uh, okay. I'm not exactly sure. So if you, I mean, if you're near a big city, uh, there are integrators, uh, you know, companies in those cities that'll come out and do this. The the owner, or excuse me, the manager here, uh, who was tasked on getting all this kind of thing done, called 
three other people before he found me. And uh, he was getting quotes that were quadruple what wow. I'm charging him. Uh, well, so and, just some, because, and I know there's, I really understand. and I know there's some vendors specifically in this industry who provide those type of services. So um, I guess let's let's go to the pricing for the mid level and then the high level kind of get a ballpark and then after that let's talk about how that they they should be shopping for you know say they're going to pay somebody to come out and do it how they should go about shopping that and and you know some key points that they need to ask so so let's do the mid point the mid tier um yeah and just it, it could be a ballpark number so mid tier what's that one going to cost them and then high end what should they be looking at and then we'll mm -hmm. talk about how they can go about shopping this yeah so i think what we're really talking about here is size Okay. Uh, when you say low, mid tier, and high end, uh, and I'm going to keep other things kind of out of this equation. So I'm not going to I'm not going to consider things like security. Cameras. We won't hold you to these numbers. We just want to give them yeah. a, a good idea so that they're they're you know it kind of gives them an idea when they're shopping around that you know uh, okay. So we'll put the caveat here. This isn't precise. This is really ballpark, but yeah. um, just give you a good idea of, of yeah of generally I would where you'll say be at. For, I would say for a mid-sized park, you know, say 50 to 100 sites uh, spread over, of, you know, four or five acres, uh, you're probably looking at, uh, you know, somewhere between 5,000 and, and 7,500. And then uh, for, you know, a high-end luxury site or say a site that uh, a park that has 100 to 200 or 250 uh, uh, sites and it's spread over maybe 10 or 15 acres, you're, you're looking at the 20 to 30,000 to get it okay. completely done. Yeah. Okay. So then, so that gives them a ballpark. So now what should they do if they're shopping for this? What should they be looking for? What questions should they be asking? You know, what's that process like for them? Is this something that they should do on their own or is it really, is there an advantage to working with a professional who can get this done right? Well, there's absolutely an advantage to working with a professional. Uh, and everybody has the idea that, uh, <clears throat> you know, Wi-Fi is simple because they've been told to think that way at, for years by Linksys, who says, buy my router, plug it into right. your ISP and push this button and everything will work fine. Well, first of all, it doesn't. It works but it, it doesn't work fine. If it hasn't been tuned properly, if it hasn't been set up properly, if it hasn't been distributed properly, you just don't know what working fine actually looks like. You think you do, but you don't. And then that is a completely separate situation than providing network to 150 separate devices all at once. So there's definitely an advantage to working with somebody that understands that and has the proper tools to do the survey, to do the uh, <clears throat> the tuning on on the system once it's installed. Because you can take it one of these modern systems, plug them in, get them to come up, have your dashboard go green, and it still won't work properly. Uh, and people get really, really, really frustrated because they just spent several thousand dollars. It says it works fine, but they're still getting complaints. Uh, you know, my goal is always to load test these things with a full park, full park, then do a survey of the of the customers and get feedback to find out if there was, you know, are there any problems spots in the park? Is there anything that I didn't notice, didn't get tuned up properly? Do we need another AP over here? Whatever the question. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of legwork involved in it. And it really does take years to to get good at it. So yeah. there's definitely an advantage. You can do it yourself. Um, I've got a prospective client right now who's who's got some engineering background, and he's confident since. And the only reason he's going to do it, he was going to bring me to a site, but he wants to get it done faster than I can get there. So what we're looking to do in that case is I'm gonna do the design, he's gonna get me the information I need to do it remotely. I'm gonna do the design, he's gonna ship me the equipment, I'm gonna get it all configured and ready to go and send it back to him, then he's gonna do the install, get it all up and running. Once he's on the internet, I can then get on it wherever I'm from and do the tuning 
and he can be my hands on the spot. So we're going to try that. I haven't done it in the past, but it, I, you know, talking with this guy, I think we would get it done. So I, I, I think that that's possible. So, you know, people can do it themselves, but, I, you know, just be cautious and set your expectations accordingly. Okay. All right. Well, what would be the key questions if they're out there shopping for providers who can set this up for them? Um, what are the key questions they should ask if they're shopping for that? Well, the, for if, if they're shopping for internet, no, if they're shop. shopping for somebody in, in your role, you know, who okay. can help set them up. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, it's, it's going to be, I, I would look at reviews, to be honest with you. I would, I would uh, talk to people who's worked with, the, work, worked with them in the past and find out, okay. uh, you know, how satisfied they, they were. Uh, you know, at the, there's the, the questions it's going to be the same questions you would ask of any business, right? Any business that you're going to count on an ongoing, because you are going to count on these people on an ongoing basis, right? It's not going to be, a, it's not going to be a, a, a fire and forget. It never is. Uh, especially with, with Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi RF radiation is a very strange thing, right? I mean, it, it, it I look at it all day, every day, and it never ceases to amaze me. In a millisecond, the entire picture can change uh, from what you you had. And you've got to be your system has to be able to adjust for that, right? And and most systems, uh, if they're not set up properly, can't do it. So you need somebody that's got some experience with that. Uh, and, and honestly, the best best way for a you know a lay person to find out uh what they're getting is going to be through other customers who who've used them so I, I would i would talk to uh, i would go online you know i would uh, i would read the reviews and and talk to and ask for other uh, other customers uh, as references and talk to them personally because they're going to be the ones that are going to know, uh, you know, did they deliver what they promised? Did they deliver what they promised when they promised it? Did they stay in budget? Are they responsive to me when I have problems? Uh, uh, did they did they charge me what they said they were going to charge me? You know, those sort of things. The, the only way you're going to find out if that's true is by talking to other customers. Okay, so, and you're providing the service to campground and RV parks. How can they reach out to you for more information? So, right now, I'm, uh, I'm not doing any advertising. I'm not, uh, I'm not incorporated in any way. So, the best way to reach to me, reach out to me right now is uh, via my online presence. Uh, my, you can reach out to me on, on email or on Facebook. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Sliversnake at yahoo.com. On email and on Facebook, I'm Serenity Mobile Observatory, because I also uh, do astrophotography at night. Oh, very cool! Oh, I want to see some of those pictures. And we met um, through the Facebook group. We've got an exclusive owner and park operators Facebook group. You came very highly recommended and have been a great asset and a great resource for this. And I appreciate your time on this call. So I'll put the links down at the bottom of this video so that you can connect with us and also connect with the Facebook group. So if you own a park, you don't know what I'm talking about, click on the link. It's a really good resource. We have several hundred park owners in there and interacting with one another, discussing these type of issues. So it's a really good resource. I'm Mark Kepp at campgroundviews.com. Thank you, Chris, for uh, sharing your insight with us. I hope it's useful to the park operators out there because if Wi-Fi is good, your customers are happy and everybody's loving camping, so it's all good. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it, and I hope I was helpful. 